No matter what the DNC decides, New Hampshire will hold a Democratic presidential primary in 2024. We don't know if President Joe Biden will actually participate, but his progressive challenger, best-selling author Marianne Williamson, will be on the ballot, and she's hoping the Granite State can give her the kind of boost it gave to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. Ms. Williamson is our guest this morning, and Marianne, thanks for joining us on Close Up. Thank you so much for having me. So the polls show that Democrats would like to see someone else as the nominee in 2024, yes. but the party is in this very odd space where there's this fear of Donald Trump coming back, and Democrats know that Joe Biden defeated him once, and many assume that he can do it again. So why upset that delicate balance? Well, 2024 is very different than 2020. I think that the uh, president's uh, defeat of Donald Trump was... Uh, much to be commended. I'm certainly happy that it happened. But this is a different country four years later. And I don't believe that a message that the economy is doing well is going to uh, defeat the Republicans in 2024. It's doing well for 20% of Americans. But for 80% of Americans, there is vast economic anxiety. And the president, in addition to saying that the economy is doing well, is talking about changes that are peripheral, that help people survive what is essentially an unjust economic system. What we have to do is to end that economic injustice. We need to take an economic U-turn in this country, such as positions that are considered moderate in every other advanced democracy, such as universal health care, tuition-free college and tech school, free child care, uh, sick pay, uh, family leave after a child is born, and a guaranteed living wage. We need to make those kind of fundamental changes that represent fundamental economic reform. Is this about winning or is it about making that progressive case? It's about winning because this country can't wait. You have 68, you have 68,000 Americans who die every year for lack of health care. I'm sure everybody who is listening knows someone who is rationing their insulin. We have um, uh, 85 million Americans who either ha are uninsured or underinsured uh, when it comes to their health care. We have 12 million hungry uh, children in this country, and many of them are in New Hampshire. Everybody who is listening knows that it that. Over the last 50 years, they might not know the statistic, but everybody knows that our middle class has been decimated. There has been a $50 trillion transfer of wealth from the bottom 90% to the top 1% over the last 48 years. And the, the incremental changes represented by uh, President Biden only help people survive. People, government policy should help people thrive, not just have to survive. There are too many Americans, including too many uh, Granite Staters, who are having to work more than one job, who are working at jobs that they don't like, but they have to be there in order to get the uh, health care. You know, Adam, during the 1970s, the average American worker had decent benefits, could afford a home, could afford a car, could afford a yearly vacation, could afford for one parent to stay home if they wanted, and could afford to send their kids to college. It is public policy which has devastated that vision, and we need to get this car back on the road to those things through the issues that I stand for, and actually that the president doesn't. And it could be a very different looking primary here in New Hampshire in particular. From your perspective, what yes. is the DNC trying to do by relegating New Hampshire in the process? Well, hello. The president did not do well here. Uh, the Granite Staters are known for their openness to independent ideas, progressive ideas, and so uh, the DNC clearly is trying to shuttle that to the side and go right to a state where the president has done well. I think democracy matters. I think voters should have a chance. Voters should hear as many voices as possible. And so what's happening here is an effort to clear the field so that there's only one candidate that people feel is really their option. And we know the knives have been out for New Hampshire from both parties for a long time. But you have a unique perspective here because, you know, you're a best-selling author. You're a notable individual beforehand. But then when you ran for president, you became something of an outsider. And you saw the efforts to sort of <coughs> dismiss you and diminish you. And now that's happening not just to you but to the New Hampshire primary as well. You know, people want to laugh at you. They want to laugh at us. They want to discount this whole process right now. So how do you pushback against establishment ridicule? Well, it's difficult simply because they, to be quite honest, they lie. Uh, they'll say that you don't believe in science or they'll say that you're some crystal lady nutcase. It, it's difficult because they have podiums and they have platforms that you don't necessarily have. But when you actually talk to individuals, when you actually talk to the voters, when you actually have opportunities like you're giving me now to talk to people about what you stand for, the American people have awakened. The American people are beginning to realize 
that they've been sort of played by the political establishment. What is the political establishment so self-congratulatory for? We're six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of our democracy, in terms of the state of our economy, in terms of the state of people's health. People are falling apart in this country. And the system which is saying we're the political class and we're the only grown-ups in the room, I would argue that maybe they're not such grown-ups in the room if they are willing to knowingly allow a child to go hungry. People are awakening to this, uh, to this idea of this almost aristocratic political class and the, the huge corporate interests that they represent from insurance companies, big pharmaceutical companies, big oil defense contractors, etc. So what I'm counting on is that enough Americans are, are awakening to the fact that uh, what the establishment wants you to think is fringe is, as I say, consider it moderate in, in, moderate in any other advanced democracy where, by every indicator, people are much happier and citizens get much more for their tax dollars. You are pro-choice, but your position on abortion isn't what can, many would consider orthodox uh, these days for the Democratic Party or progressives. Something you wrote in 2011, quote, I've been disturbed over the years by how the issue has been contextualized on the political left. I saw it as a problematical thing both morally and politically. So do you think the effort to portray abortion as just a medical procedure with no moral dimension is part of what led to the Roe decision falling? I think it is a moral issue, but it is an issue of private morality, not public morality. I don't think the government has any say. I trust the moral decision making of the American woman. It should be a decision made by women in consult with the God of their understanding, however the woman sees that and however the woman feels is best for her life and her body. Government should have nothing to say about that. By having a slightly different perspective here though, do you risk alienating some of those women voters outraged by the Dobbs decision who want not nuance, but a warrior. You know, I'll tell you something. If you are running for political office and you're actually standing on principle and you're actually clear about your own beliefs and your own values, you're going to turn off somebody. You know, I'm not doing this to try to people please. You know, I'm not trying to do this to figure out what other people want me to say. I'm trying to place before the American people an agenda for fundamental change. And I want the American people to, to get to experience the choices that democracy represents and that's what I hope that New Hampshire will stand for uh, to really take a stand for the conversation that will dominate this uh, this campaign season not one that is forced upon us by the DNC but one that the people in the primary states namely the first in, in the nation New Hampshire says is the conversation we should be having and I believe that there are people in New Hampshire as well as as in other places who feel yes uh, women should have that choice it should be uh, a right of every woman. Government should not have any say what she does with her body, who are, are who recognize that the Dobbs decision is terrible, that the government should not be taking away that right from people, but who have no problem with recognizing that there is a larger, more nuanced conversation. We're adults, and we should be able to have that as well. You mentioned your uh, ambitious progressive agenda you want to pass, uh, universal health care, free college. How do you pay for it? Well, it's so interesting. If you look at the money that we're paying on health care now, we now have, like, what, 20% uh, of our GDP in the advanced and democracies where they have universal health care, it's five, six, seven percent of their GDP. The question is how do we afford not to have universal health care? And also we're paying for it not only with our dollars, we're paying for it with our lives. And that's what we need to remember. Uh, when you have one in four Americans who are living with medical debt, you don't even have medical debt anywhere in a, in a place where you have universal health care. We have an $88 billion medical debt uh, in this country. People's lives are falling apart because of this, uh, their bodies and their souls. So the question is not how do we pay for it. The question is how can we afford not to do this. I quickly want to touch on foreign policy. Uh, is the American commitment to Ukraine open-ended in your opinion? No, it should not be open-ended. But right now, let's be very clear. If we were to withdraw our military support from Ukraine right now, there would simply be no more Ukraine. And that would not be considered tolerable by me. Hmm. Um, question for you here on uh, style. Uh, oh, pardon? Style. Style. The, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm curious, and we talked a little bit about this in our previous interview uh, last week, you know, what you learned from 2020 and what changes about Marianne Williamson's approach to the cam tra campaign trail in 2024? Well, I don't think there's a question in my, st uh, any change in my style. I just style. noticed a little bit more pugnacious. There seems to be a harder really? edge. You know? it, wait, so in a good way or a bad way? I, I, I take uh, no comment on that. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I just noticed there was, you know, there was a little bit more fire. 
Really? In that speech that you gave in Hampton. Well, I'll tell you something, Adam, I, and I'd mentioned this to you earlier. I didn't know if I would be doing this again. And if I wasn't really disgusted by, by some of the basic public policy positions in this country and what is happening, uh, then I wouldn't be here again. We have a genuine neo-fascist authoritarian threat in our midst. This is very, very serious. No one needs to convince me how important it is that the Democrats uh, defeat the Republican candidate, should they be someone who represents that, that threat, and m most of them do. I'm not someone who is, who is blocking the ability of the Democrats to stand up to that challenge. I'm running because I believe that I'm the person who can do it. So if there's a pugnaciousness to it or a fire to it, I just hope that it's a positive one. You know, uh, Martin Luther King said we must conduct our struggle on the higher plane of dignity and discipline. And I certainly hope that people can see that uh, commitment on my part to love and to honorable debate. Uh, I was speaking yesterday at the at the, um, uh, the New Hampshire Senate, and I, I said, you know, that, uh, I'm I'm standing for the people uh, who represent government's willingness to expand the democratic franchise to everyone, to women, to black people, to um, uh, to transgender. I want to see an expansion of democratic rights, not a diminishment of them. But yeah, we're going to duke it out. That's what happens in democracy. But let's do it with respect and let's do it with honor. And I hope that people see my commitment to that. All right, Marianne Williamson, we'll see you out there on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank you.